I guess let's go ahead and get started. And uh, welcome to all of our viewers who are uh, watching us via live broadcast. This is our Human System Integration uh, Knowledge Broadcast Series. And uh, we have a couple of presenters today. I'm just going to give a brief overview to get us started and then pass it off to our presenters. There you go. So just to go over it a little bit again, what are these knowledge broadcasts and what are they all about? The knowledge broadcast series is an in-reach effort to increase awareness of really what we're already doing today, uh, mostly at the directorate level or within the directorate on many different levels um, in regard to human system integration, looking at tools, practices, general areas of interest. Uh, we do have a SharePoint um, site, and uh, that's shown below under this HSI Knowledge Broadcast website. And so all of these presentations will be um, uh, in presentation format on the website, and the presentations themselves, as they're being broadcast, are also being recorded, and those uh, um, recorded um, presentations will be logged on the website as well. So just kind of overall, again, to set the stage for what you're going to hear about today, human system integration does just that. It integrates human health and performance concerns. So it allows for the crew to be considered as part of the system and t part of the total system performance. So that helps to identify key drivers to vehicle design or architecture to help shape operational concepts and also to evaluate crew needs. And one of the important things is, is that allows for humans to be traded or to be considered in trades equally with other vehicle subsystems. And uh, the importance about this is that, you know, again, we do bits and pieces of this now. We really do. But it's important to do this not as an afterthought, but to do it throughout the project uh, life cycle. And that's all the way from the very beginning to the, you know, decommission, off through operations and to the decommission. And so in um, uh, Doug Wong's pitch, you're going to hear more about kind of the organization and how the people have been set up to do this. And in David Fitz's pitch, you're going to hear more about this tie to the life cycle. Um, so we really do a lot of this, but again, we're just trying to uh, connect the dots. And you're going to hear David talk more in David's pitch than in Doug's pitch, but you're, you're going to hear him talk about these domain areas, and that's kind of what these puzzle pieces are representing. Um, you know, we're still figuring out what definition is tied to each one of those little puzzle pieces, so to speak. But um, that's not the important part here. The important part here is we're all working towards one end or common goal and, uh, you know, reducing life cycle costs, making the mission safe, uh, making sure the crew is safe, improving system performance. And we do that by considering the crew as part of the system. Um, so again, HSI, just an overview, helps us to connect the dots and to look at that bigger picture in regard to human systems integration, where we're looking at human health and performance. So with that, I'll go ahead and um, hand the presentation over to our first presenter, who is David Fitz. This uh, presentation that he's about to present was developed for the um, HSIS conference, which is going to be in a couple of weeks. And uh, David is our um, branch chief for the Habitability and Human Factors branch here at Johnson Space Center. And um, with that, I'd like to pass it over to David. And let me give you the mic, and I'll go ahead and get your presentation queued up. Great. Thanks, Debbie. And the first thing I'd like to do is thank Debbie and Deronda and Kate for setting up this series. I'm really pleased to see this, uh, this attempt at broadcasting more information about human systems integration and bringing more awareness to the table. I'm feeling just a little schizophrenic about today's presentation because the, uh, this presentation was developed for 
Human Systems Integration Symposium, a conference that occurs every year in Annapolis, Maryland. And it's, it's primarily a Department of Defense conference, a symposium, and primarily bringing human systems integration practitioners together. So um, I'll be singing to the choir, if you will, about human systems integration. This, uh, this is, will be a very informed crowd. But I also feel I need today to help explain a little bit more to the audience watching this broadcast what human systems integration is and what it might mean to, to NASA. So with that in mind, I added a couple charts here at the beginning. The first one gives a definition for human systems integration. This is from INCOSE, the International Congress for Systems Engineering, who are very interested in, in looking at HSI and integrating it into the systems engineering process. The you know, definition is that the, the HSI is the interdisciplinary technical and management processes for integrating human considerations within and across all system elements. What's a human consideration? It's any discipline that relates to um, human concerns. And that includes a wide variety of disciplines, everything from psychiatry to medicine to human factors engineering to environmental engineering. Anything that takes the human into consideration um, more, perhaps, than uh, strictly systems engineering might. In the Department of Defense, Human Systems Integration, or HSI, has a very specific meaning. That's because HSI was mandated uh, a few years ago as a requirement for all acquisition contracts. I'll touch on that a little more. But a uh, little uh, more on what HSI might be. HSI focuses on human and system performance. There are some disciplines, some human considerations that might focus more on the performance of the human and others that might focus more on performance of the system. For example, in uh, medicine and behavioral domains might focus more on how we can help the human perform, whereas human factors engineering, habitability, environmental factors might focus more on how we can help the system accommodate the human. But overall, the discipline of human systems integration is looking at the interaction of the two. How can, what, how can we measure and increase the performance of the human plus the system? So since about 2000, HSI is mandated in the Department of Defense. And uh, right out of the, uh, the mandating words, it says the project manager shall apply HSI to optimize total system performance, operational effectiveness, and suitability, survivability, safety, and affordability. And let me make it clear up front, and it will be very clear to this, uh, this symposium, the purpose of this mandate for HSI was not to make nicer user interfaces. It was to save money. Because what the Department of Defense was finding is that 80% of the operational cost of any weapon system occurs after the, the project manager who's developing the system says, I'm done. It occurs in the operations. Uh, field, everything from the user interactions to the uh, maintenance of the system, the deployment of the system. So all of those costs together are much more expensive than the actual development. So the military is looking at how you can learn from those operational needs and bring that back into the development cycle and make sure the human is always considered in the, in the development of the system. HSI also is well defined in terms of which domains. Now, this varies from service to service, and this is primarily the Air Force's model. But um, uh, the disciplines include human factors engineering, habitability, environmental factors, occupational health, countermeasures, survivability, system safety, training, manpower, and personnel capabilities. And uh, I've highlighted the ones that I feel <coughs> there, there's a counterpart to in the Space Life Sciences Directorate here at uh, JSC. We are looking inside space life sciences at what we can learn from this DOD model of human systems integration to better integrate across these, these uh, human concerns, particularly, of course, the ones that are highlighted. So I'll start with the charts that uh, will be for the presentation. I want to emphasize to this group We've been talking for a number of, of years, and they're very interested in what NASA is doing because in some ways, what we're doing is working more effectively than what's happening in the DOD. In other ways, we have things to learn from them. 
even though there was a mandate that says you shall include HSI, they're still trying to, uh, they're still dealing with basics on how do you actually make that happen. So I want to emphasize to this group that there is no HSI agency-wide um, perspective or mandate in NASA. What we've done to uh, perform equivalent functions has been on our own based on what we see as the need for integrating human concerns into the system. At the Johnson Space Center, where most of the human spaceflight programs reside, and most of the projects that relate to human carrying vehicles, such as the orbiter, such as CEV, uh, such as the lander, uh, the primary provider of the equivalent of HSI uh, capabilities is Space Life Sciences Directorate here at JSC, although we definitely include uh, disciplines and activities from other directorates as well as uh, capabilities from other centers. This is the NASA project lifecycle. This is a snapshot taken right out of the NASA system, Systems Engineering Handbook. And I want to, the purpose of including this is to illustrate to our counterparts in the DOD that our roadmap for a project lifecycle is not that different than the DOD roadmaps. Um, it inclu includes a period of project formulation, a period of development in which products are ultimately delivered, and then a period of operations. A model that I have used in our own branch, Habitability and Human Factors, for a number of years is this model. And I've said, in order for us to have a capability, a fully functional capability in human factors and habitability, we have to be active in and capable to perform in these six capabilities. Requirements development. We have to be able to write good requirements that are measurable, objective, and verifiable. We have to be able to supply requirements integration teams that work inside programs and projects that help explain to people um, the nature of our requirements, why it's important for them to flow to every element of the project, and in some cases, what it is we're looking for as an outcome. Um, the, I certainly have found that most project managers come from an engineering background, and having had much of an engineering education myself, the engineering uh, curriculum doesn't often deal with human interfaces. And so uh, people practicing in engineering aren't always equipped to deal with the, with the human. We're here to help make that happen. Design, when requirements aren't enough, we roll up our sleeves and get involved in the design of uh, activities of a project. Verification, that's confirmation, formal and otherwise, that our requirements are being addressed and being met. Operations, where we look at the post-deployment uh, period, where we look at operations and say, well, well how well did all of that, that uh, preliminary work during development work? And then research, where we have the opportunity in a functional human factors program to go back and fill a gap where we, we learned that uh, hey, we needed better requirements in a particular area, or we needed to address a capability or concern that wasn't addressed well before. So when all of these things are addressed well in a project, and this applies to, I feel, any domain within human systems integration. I use this model for human factors and habitability because I know we use it in the branch, but I feel this would apply to any domain. When all these, these capabilities are effectively addressed in a project through the life cycle, I'm um, using the term vertical integration occurs. In other words, that particular domain or function is vertically integrated into the uh, program or project. Horizontal integration occurs when you put the integration into HSI. When you look across the human domains or human-centered design domains and you come up with a cohesive common answer um, that the programs are looking for in the same way that systems engineering and integration works among hard, um, hardware and software engineering, how do you come up with a consolidated human systems integration <coughs> input to a program or project? We're calling that horizontal in integration. And the intent here is to deliver a cohesive product, not for each of these domains to go forward to a program and project with their own interpretation, but how can, how can uh, HSI or some equivalent to it in NASA deliver a cohesive product of programs and projects? And what I'm proposing in this presentation is 
an approach to doing this because on the previous chart, the DOD, we find, is continually asking the question, well, how do we do this? We have this mandate to do this, but how do we, do, how do we perform this horizontal integration? And in our experience, and certainly in my experience in our branch, one way to do that, this is to take those six capabilities and break the horizontal integration process into six horizontal integration processes, each having its own um, series of practices and techniques that make it work, and uh, it, thereby each becomes a more manageable project uh, process. And in effect, that's this ends my presentation. This is the message I want to get across. I could say go read the paper if you want to uh, get more information, but I have 14 more charts. Uh, this is the message I want to get across at the symposium, and I think it will be of interest to people because they've been dealing with this, uh, this issue of how you perform this horizontal integration. One person we talked with recently at the Army Research Laboratory said, in effect, they don't know how to do this. They don't know how to um, take information from these uh, quite varied domains and, and integrate them into a cohesive response. So they basically take the reports from each one and staple them together. We're looking at a more proactive uh, approach. I'm going to talk about each of these six um, capabilities briefly here. Requirements development. Requirements is where we take our standards, and in our particular branch, human factors, I thank our forefathers for, in the 80s, having the, uh, the foresight to develop the Manned Systems Integration Standard, or NASA Standard 3000. Yes, thank you, Barry. Uh, <laughs> because I feel this, this gave human factors a future in the International Space Station program and in the Constellation program and programs yet to come. Because when, when uh, people are already familiar with this document, when International Space Station or its predecessor, Freedom, were in formation, they said, well, we want this. We want this integrated into our program. Um, and again, I'm grateful that it existed. So what, what happens when a project or program is in formation is we take these standards and we develop in them into program-specific requirements. This happened on Space Station, and from NASA Standard 3000, we tailored or derived SSP 50005 uh, the, the space station specific equivalent, and for Constellation program, the Constellation program 70,024, or the Constellation program human systems integration requirements, HSIR. And I feel the HSIR in particular is an excellent product, and we've, we've distributed it to people in the military, and they've said, this is great. We need something like this. Um, one thing that surprises me in DOD and it's going to be a topic of conversation, I'm sure, at this symposium, is that the DOD doesn't work to equivalent requirements. Um, they work through other mechanisms. But to me, requirements in the NASA process gives us a foundation on which to build the other six capabilities. Without a firm set of requirements, we'd have a hard time going to programs and projects and arguing, well, we need a requirements integration team. We need a verification team. But we have a good set of requirements integrated into the programs and projects for HSI concerns. And I think that that puts us in a, a good place. But it also separates our culture quite a bit from the current practices in the DOD. Um, as I said, I feel that requirements is the foundation for the, the circle of six capabilities. Uh, it's, it's important for programs and projects to embrace our uh, requirements and make them their own. And in doing so, programs and projects have very specific ways that they want requirements to be written. And we're finding as time goes on uh, with our, our relatively small sample of new human spaceflight programs, uh, that uh, the process is more and more stringent over time, which to me is a good thing because it forces us to be objective, um, look at validity of our requirements, look at measurability and verifiability of our requirements. And our requirements would not be in the HSIR if they couldn't meet these measures right now. Also, it requires us to be thinking about rationale for each requirement and a verification statement. It's a very good thing. But one of the messages here in that horizontal integration process 
is that that's largely driven by programs. So we can take a program-driven um, um, set of constraints and use that to perform horizontal integration uh, in a, across HSI domains. Uh, that's not always the case. No, programs don't always provide us the structure to do that in some of the other of uh, the six capabilities, but we'll talk about that. Within space life sciences, I feel we've developed good social integration tools, which is a term that I find the DOD practitioners using. And just one cultural difference here between us and the DOD, it's what I call the small town syndrome. JSC is small enough to where we can get the right people in space life sciences together in a room and talk face to face when we have differences of opinions among the different domains. JSC is small enough to where we can sit down with the program managers and talk about our differences and reach resolution. The DOD is so extended and so big, they're dealing with something akin to 700 to 800 acquisition projects at any one time and the different domain capabilities might be spread in different states. So the habitability group is in a different state than the group ha that has responsibility for human factors. So they're not always as able to meet face to face and talk through differences. And well, we, ne we need to learn more about that and the tools that they develop to um, counter that because we do have an extended network ultimately because they're human factors and other uh, HSI domain practitioners in other states that we um, always need to bring to the table. This is just an example of some of the topics in our standards, primarily to let the DOD personnel know. So let me move on to the next of the six capabilities, requirements integration. Requirements integration, I'm defining as any process with the goal of ensuring that requirements are understood and flow to all levels of development. In other words, we don't just take our requirements, good as we feel they are, as well integrated and well vetted into the program as they are, and throw them across the fence. It's always important for our subject matter experts to be able to engage with the program because not everything that uh, comes up in a program um, is thought about during the requirements development process. So there are always issues that come up that we need to uh, be interfacing with the program. We need to help engineers understand our requirements. We need to help designers and uh, uh, people responsible for the acquisition contracts understand our requirements. And again, like I said, there's always unknowns that, that surface. The goal here is to reduce the risk through the development process of our requirements not being met. We don't want to end up at verification, at formal verification at the end of the development cycle and there be any surprises that our requirements might not be met. So the requirements integration teams are always there to help people understand the requirements and um, reduce the risk of the, the requirements not being met. These uh, re this requirements integration process is typically met by teams of people who have subject matter expertise in a particular domain. And um, just as an example, one of course I'm familiar with, the human factors team, we've had successful requirements integration teams since I came into this branch in 1994, where uh, in space station program, human factors was treated as a system equal to other systems in that program's systems engineering and integration process. And that's where we want to be. We want human systems integration. We want human considerations to be an equal consideration with other systems in the systems engineering process uh, and management. Again, our social integration tools within space life sciences forums, such as the ops tag and the, the risk forum, are very useful to address commonalities and differences among um, the different domains when we're talking about requirements integration processes. This next chart just shows, especially for the DOD personnel, a few of the titles that we have. The important thing I think that will surprise some of the DOD personnel is that these are program recognized titles. So at the Constellation program level, we have, for example, a human systems integration group lead with that title, uh, program recognized title. In the CEV project, we have both a human systems integration lead from Space Life Sciences Directorate 
and a human engineering subsystem manager, as well as subsystem managers for environments, radiation, space medicine, and food systems that are recognized by the program. And that, that is an excellent place to be. We want the program to recognize these. And the program funds the existence of these teams as well. That will be different than the DOD culture, I suspect. Design. Design is one of the six capabilities. And perhaps it's because the chief of this branch and the deputy of this branch both have architectural backgrounds. But we saw years ago that uh, as well as our requirements might be written, as well as we might have teams working with people in the programs to understand the requirements, sometimes requirements aren't enough. And you have to roll up your sleeves and get involved in the design process. And we developed a capability to do that along the way. We brought in people with architectural backgrounds and industrial design backgrounds and created a habitability design center within the branch. A perfect example of this, what I'm talking about here, uh, comes to mind from space station program in the late 80s. The challenge was to, how do we get something as simple as the location coding labels in the space station, the ones above the racks, to look the same in all the modules? when the modules are coming from different vendors, different countries, how do we get those labels to look the same? And there were people in the space station program at the time that said we have to do that by writing word requirements. And I'm reminded of the, uh, the, the legend of the six blind men describing an elephant. One goes up to the tail and says, well, I think an elephant's like a rope. One goes up to a leg and says, well, I think an element, uh, elephant is like a tree trunk. One goes up to an ear and says, well, I, I think an elephant's like a sail. We couldn't throw enough words at this simple problem to ensure commonality. What we wanted to do was simply give them a picture, say, make this label look like this. And yet there were people in the program who said, we can't do that. We're, we're issuing a design solution. You've got to write requirements. You've got to write word requirements. Finally, the division chief there said, especially when he was handed a price tag from the, uh, from the uh, vendor saying they wanted $200,000 to write this requirements book, uh, that give me a picture. And that led to our managing a set of uh, DeKal, the DeKal catalog for the International Space Station, where when we want commonality, we simply give them a design solution and say it should be like this. To extrapolate that to larger systems, that is the opportunity that the Habitability Design Center is looking for, particularly in habitability, where we found that uh, it's some, something of an emerging field, and exactly what constitutes habitability was still a work in progress. So um, we have found the HDC to be particularly effective in programs that spend time in the conceptual design phase, uh, and particularly with NASA teams before they issue a contract. It becomes harder for engagement of HDC at this time once a contract is let. But a uh, few examples of uh, capabilities of the HDC, sometimes we do graphic prototyping, making recommendations on what a design solution might look like. These are some example user interfaces. Here we're working with a team looking at uh, possible ways that uh, lunar habitat might be established. And here we're looking at uh, storage labels and storage systems. Physical pro prototyping, this group has the capability to build models and full-scale mock-ups. This is a, a model of uh, a module. This is a model of uh, the interior size of CE CEV when we were first looking at, well, how big should this be? And then particular systems. But the Habitability Design Center is not just a model shop. The important capability that makes it something beyond that is user evaluation. Because the data that comes out of this facility isn't a mock-up, it's the evaluation by the users. It's taking one design versus another design and saying, in the operational period, this one is going to be more effective because we have that user feedback. And we're doing this early enough in the design cycle where we can inform the developers um, and help make design decisions when, when it's cost effective to do so. So what does this have to do with horizontal integration? 
these evaluations in particular can be broad enough to be cross-disciplinary among uh, HSI or Space Life Sciences or uh, Health and Medical Technical Authority domains to be inclusive. And it's in the evaluation phase that I feel there's opportunity for um, cross-discipline integration. The remaining three verification I'll touch on fairly quickly here. Verification is not just the formal process where at the end of a project we, we formally accept that our requirements are being met. To me, verification is a continuum that reduces risk through the entire development cycle to ensure that once we get to that point, we're not going to be surprised. Uh, verification is also some rigor that early on uh, communicates to the designer what kind of test or analysis or um, demonstration is going to be needed to confirm that a particular requirement is met. So there are um, there's some rigidity, if you will, to the verification process and discipline that needs to be incorporated into it. Um, requirements integration teams are often the ones monitoring this process through the entire development cycle. And again, just like requirements development, verification processes are often very strictly defined by programs. And they're, they're program managed processes. So the horizontal integration across domains uh, can be dealt with simply by compliance with the program requirements for verification. Uh, sometimes the challenge for HSI is ensuring that um, everything is objective and measurable and verifiable all the way through and that we're not making subjective demands at all. Operations, that's the ultimate proving ground for the other four, the first four that I talked about. In order to, our, our requirements or HSI in general often doesn't manifest itself until the operational period. The development cycle is the development typically of the hardware and the software systems. As I said up front, we're always looking at human system performance, human plus system performance. And the two typically don't come together until they're deployed in the field. So how can we do predictive measurements in the development phase to help ensure that when operations come, there won't be surprises? We have a lot of forward work to do in this area to develop those predictive models. And the DOD says this is one of their biggest concerns too. How do we take objective information back to the program managers during development that says, well, design A is a whole lot better than design B and it's going to save you money? Um, so I think this will be a topic of conversation at human systems integration symposiums for years to come. But for us, participation in operations means that we have to have an active program to monitor operations, monitor the performance of our requirements during the operations, and, and we do, although there are, uh, there's forward work that we need to do to ensure that we're collecting um, more objective data in this area. Again, our um, social integration tools within space life sciences are useful, are very useful to get together and talk about operational concerns, the ops tag and the uh, risk form. Research. Research some may think is not part of the life cycle, and it's not, typically. But as I said about the six capabilities model uh, early on, it is what I feel, the six capabilities are what I feel are needed to have a very viable, in our case, human factors domain program or habitability domain program, because research gives us the opportunity to um, establish the long view. Research gives us the opportunity to say, well, what didn't work? What didn't we know that we can go back and perform research on in order to fill this gap? And we don't have to wait for the end of a uh, program to do that. We're always learning, um, even during the development cycle, we're always learning of areas that we need to get smarter on. We need to um, develop techniques in order to gather more objective data to help satisfy a program concern. So research to me, has to be an equal and uh, capable part of a viable domain program. Fortunately, in NASA, in space life sciences, or in HSI concerns, we have the human research program, which is, is an extremely effective tool. And it allows us to do directed research, directed at solving 
program problems. One of the metrics for the human research program is what benefit is it having on the current NASA human spaceflight programs and projects. With, that is a tremendous asset to us, and uh, we can definitely cite examples where HRP has helped solve current Constellation program um, problems and concerns. So finally, coming back to uh, the message, again, this is the message for this conference, for this conversation, and for further conversations, side conversations at this symposium, is that what we're proposing, or what we postulate might be of some benefit to a DFD model is to break that horizontal integration process down into components. These six capabilities are the ones that I cite, it's the ones that I've used as a model within our branch for years as capabilities that, uh, that we need to have. Um, there might be others. Um, but the important thing is to break that horizontal integration process down into uh, subcomponents. I think each of these these horizontal lines is worth a paper in itself. The, um, as I said all along, the requirements integration, um, I meant to say requirements development, sorry, error here. Requirements development and verification project processes or capabilities are usually very well defined by a program. So they give us a method to tie all of our concerns together. They give us a format. They give us a format for requirements, for verification. They give us a structure to uh, that, that drive horizontal integration among our different domains. But the other four, I feel the burden is on a, an HSI mindset to pull together and maintain those capabilities. So it's up to HSI organizations. And Throughout this presentation, I'm using the term HSI, a reminder, even though there's no formal HSI uh, program within NASA, because it's going to communicate to the particular audience this pitch was designed for. But uh, HSI in particular must develop that capability to participate in design and in research. I, I feel those capabilities always have to be there to have a fully effective domain and cross-domain program. And um, I, I feel that the way we work provides lessons learned for uh, some of the DOD practitioners. And finally, although nothing I've said here uh, is formally codified in NASA right now, I feel that this reflects in actuality the way we work and that gives us a pretty viable HSI equivalent program that, that uh, horizontally integrates our human considerations. And that's my presentation. Are there any questions here in the room? Okay, I'd like to pass the microphone on then to Doug. Doug is going to um, be presenting a uh, presentation that's also going to Human Systems um, Integration Symposium 2009 in a couple of weeks. Let me go ahead and introduce Doug real quick. <laughs> Thanks, David. That was really good. Appreciate that. Um, just a brief bit of information about Doug. Um, Doug works in our habitability and human factors uh, branch as well here at JSC, um, although he came to us by way of Langley a few years back. Um, Doug's an aerospace human factors engineer and he also has a, a master's uh, master of science degree in mechanical engineering and he holds a professional um, engineering license in the state of Virginia and uh, Doug's had a lot of varied uh, background in his work but he's definitely uh, done a lot of work uh, in the human-centered um, design area. And uh, his paper today, he'll talk to you more about um, this human factors interface with systems engineering for NASA human spaceflight. Well, first of all, I know to use the clip. Got it. 
Thank you very much, Debbie, and uh, very nice to meet uh, all of you here and those audience outside. Um, I guess uh, earlier you have heard uh, uh, about uh, the tools that we have developed uh, uh, in terms of uh, human systems uh, integration. What I'd like to do now is to um, sort of give you an overview on what we are doing uh, in our branch uh, to promote the human systems integration idea as part of the uh, NASA's uh, systems engineering process. And uh, I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, just explain uh, what, where we come from, okay, uh, this model called human as a system, and also uh, talk about uh, the, our past success, some of our current endeavors, and what we plan for the future. So who are we? Okay, we are the uh, Habitability and Human Factors branch, and we are part of the uh, Space Life Science Directorate over here, or SA. And our main product is uh, Human Factors Engineering, and uh, we've been supporting the NASA space program since uh, 1987. So um, some of the work that we do uh, includes uh, 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 human factors, hab uh, habit habit habitat designs, and then uh, developing requirements, and uh, usability analysis and uh, uh, hu space human factors uh, research. Um, uh, human as a system design model. I think our, our, our success in the past uh, 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 couple of decades uh, has a lot to do with uh, our promotion of the human as a system um, uh, design philosophy. Uh, what is it? Um, we think that the human uh, are ultimately uh, the uh, the main user of the system, so uh, the systems are, are actually should be designed uh, to be used by the human, and uh, and uh, also uh, uh, humans should be considered uh, as part of the system or as the systems with a uh, system within the system, and as a result, uh, the human factors, the disciplines we believe should play a very uh, prominent role in the uh, overall system design process. And now you see a picture over here, um, the, the, the Spider-Man that you see at the bottom over there, which is actually not our product, but uh, I just couldn't help it. I saw this picture online. Uh, that sort of gives you a very uh, dramatic example on what, what the human systems integration is. Um, uh, we have really done a lot in the, in the past uh, 20 years or so, and um, this is just a list of uh, some of the uh, more uh, major things that we have done. Um, we have certainly done a lot more than this, but uh, I would like to go over, the, over this just because of their implications on how important they are. Um, you have heard a little bit on uh, uh, NASA Standard 3000 uh, earlier in David's talk, and uh, we're very glad to have our uh, our, our, our original uh, developer here, uh, Barry Tillman, he's also in our audience, and, uh, and among others too. Um, the uh, human uh, NASA Standard 3000 was, div uh, was released uh, 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 slightly over 20 years ago. I won't go into the age thing, okay, <laughs> over here, but you saw again an idea. Um, it is a, a major human design uh, guide for space equipment. And uh, I'm very proud to uh, let you know that uh, in addition to the space uh, community, uh, other, uh, uh, th this document has been used widely, uh, 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 I can say worldwide, uh, in, the space human uh, in the human factors community in general. Uh, it also has uh, much, uh, appli uh, many applications for terrestrial uh, environment, uh, just uh, to, uh, as long as you recognize that there are some particular re uh, requirements that are tailored towards a micro G environment, okay? And uh, there's a subset of this uh, a document uh, uh, is called the NASA Standard 3000T, uh, which is a specific document uh, we used for the International Space Station as a contractually binding uh, human factor systems integration design requirements. And uh, for those who are interested, you can actually go to the website as indicated here to learn more about this uh, uh, document. I think uh, the document is actually online. Um, the NASA Standard 3000 is not the only thing that we do for uh, the spa as, uh, International Space Station program. We have also uh, created a, a flight crew integration group. And uh, the main job is to uh, analyze 
uh, uh, human factors related issues for uh, uh, the International Space Station. And a very uh, uh, important component of uh, FCI is the OPHAPS team. And uh, their main task is to collect and analyze space emission uh, data and also conducts the crew debriefs. And the crew de debriefs that they conduct are not only limited to uh, the ISS, and they even go into uh, uh, some space analog uh, environments to collect uh, the, the uh, necessary data. Um, they also conduct uh, uh, focused uh, evaluations to identify human factors and have a bit stability improvements. And uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but uh, the data that, that they have coll collected are actually going to be used for the uh, update of the NASA standard 3000, which is the 3001. And not, not just that, the lessons that we have learned uh, from the ISS uh, are also uh, incorporated and, and benefit some of the subsequent uh, space uh, programs. Uh, uh, one of them, uh, a more prominent one, is the Orion Space uh, Vehicle, the CEV. Um, we also play a, a major role uh, in the development of the uh, NASA Systems Engineering Handbook. Uh, this, the handbook was first published in 1995. Um, it basically is a s systems uh, engineering guidebook that is tailored to the NASA systems engineering environment. And then in 2007, uh, it came out with the uh, latest revision. Uh, in, the in, in the revision, in addition to uh, making some updates, it also in incorporate a section on human factors, so and um, which is uh, actually developed by our branch, and uh, in the in the in this section, um, it helps to promote human factors engineering as a recommended uh, practice, and it also stresses stresses the important roles that the human play uh, in and in human space flight. So uh, more uh, in more particularly, the human is a critical component of the mission and the system. Um, and it also provides uh, human factors, uh, engineering analysis techniques and methods uh, uh, as a summary. And uh, for those who are in interested, the book, book is available for download in a, in a PDF form uh, in the following website. Um, HH HHFB, our branch, also manages the, the Space Human Factors Engineering Project. Uh, the Space Human a uh, Factors Engineering Project is an element of the NASA's uh, uh, Human Research Program. And the goal is to develop uh, human factors, standards, and models to ensure that space systems design are compatible uh, with the crew members, both in a sense of physical and cognitive. And uh, in back in 2005, uh, we have conducted uh, uh, research and technology gap analysis. In this analysis, uh, we uh, tried to address uh, some key questions that will help us design uh, the future uh, uh, CEV uh, vehicle. And then uh, uh, to do that, we conducted a series of uh, white paper reviews. And then we augmented uh, these uh, white papers with uh, some uh, uh, subject matter expertise uh, knowledge and also some of our historical uh, Apollo and Skylab uh, reports. And, and also uh, the space, uh, what we learned from uh, the space station, we have uh, also taken a, uh, uh, a big, uh, a great benefit out of that. And now uh, the SHFE is, uh, is sponsoring uh, many uh, research activities at NASA to try to address uh, uh, the, the gaps that's been identified. Um, one of our lab facilities uh, in, the, uh, in our branch is the uh, Lighting and, and Environmental Test Facility. Um, uh, uh, back a few years ago, uh, we, we see the, uh, with the uh, ever-increasing complexity in space operations, especially in shuttle and space station environment, we see the need to uh, develop a new kind of uh, uh, lighting system. Okay? And but uh, there, there, uh, as you know, in space there is very strange. There are some very strange requirements. Uh, for example, durability and low power. Okay, so at the end, uh, we uh, we have decided to use the then new uh, LED light emanant dial technology uh, for uh, general illumination. Nowadays, you see uh, LED technologies used uh, being used uh, quite often uh, in, for, for example, your handheld flashlights, and they are very low in power, very high brightness. But uh, we've been doing that for quite a long time. And we ended up uh, 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 developing the ring-mounted uh, 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 ring uh, LED uh, lighting system 
around the uh, shuttle cameras. And then in, uh, we, we didn't stop there. We also actually also developed uh, uh, the uh, illumination system for the uh, space shuttles. Uh, in June uh, 98, of, uh, June of 1998, uh, we flew the first set of uh, illumination sh uh, nation sh uh, nation systems uh, on the shuttle. And then uh, in a subsequent flight in 99, we actually increased the number of LEDs to uh, 180. And then last year, we actually evaluated our first uh, prototype LED lighting systems on the ISS. Uh, you can see that on the picture over there, with the uh, uh, lighting system, uh, it dramatically increases the, uh, the durability uh, on uh, this, uh, many of the surfaces on the space shuttle. Yeah, we have certainly done a lot in the past uh, decade or so, uh, two decades. But uh, we didn't stop. We have continued our efforts, OK? And I'm going to talk about a little bit more about those. First is the NASA Standard 3001. And it's an update of the NASA Standard 3000. It's currently in work. We anticipate, it, we anticipate that it will be published uh, sometime uh, this year. And uh, it defines uh, our space flight system standards for crew health and performance. And, uh, this, uh, this version will have uh, two volumes. And volume one will be on uh, crew health, and volume two will be on habitability and vi environmental health. And this, uh, just like the uh, older version, it also has uh, another spin-off um, uh, um, design handbook, OK? And uh, we'll be using the design handbook uh, for, uh, uh, to guide any future uh, space flight uh, design uh, uh, and developer requirements. And uh, with our success in the International Space Station, we have really drawn a, uh, uh, much attention to other uh, NASA space programs, and one of them being the Constellation program. So now we are actively involved in the NASA space program. Um, the uh, Constellation program, <coughs> excuse me, um, Human Systems Integration Group, uh, we are actually leading that, and it's, it, and it's a program level of authority. Um, besides many uh, important uh, responsibility, uh, it also uh, is the developer of the uh, human systems uh, integration requirements, uh, the HSIR, uh, which has become a very important document in the constell constellation program. And I believe uh, David also mentioned about that uh, earlier. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, we, uh, we also developed the crew interface labeling standards, which has also been uh, uh, widely used. So nowadays, um, um, the uh, XSEC uh, play a very important role in many of the uh, 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 Constellation projects, such as uh, the CEV, uh, the EVA, pro EVA project, uh, Altair, which is the lunar vehicle project, uh, ground ops, and also the, uh, the uh, Ares run uh, rocket. So I'll go down to one more level. In addition to the involvement in the program level, uh, uh, ha ha uh, the HSI, uh, uh, activities. We also have a, a, a very uh, a strong involvement in the uh, the Orion project in itself. Um, our, our main our main responsibility is to, to do resource planning and allocation, uh, develop uh, our, our, our requirements oversight, and validation studies and strategic uh, supports. Okay, um, I am actually uh, involved in this project myself. Uh, my main job is to uh, conduct uh, uh, human-related uh, uh, modeling and simulation validations, which is a very uh, critical area and, and, uh, and uh, not in itself. And uh, in addition to all those, um, we also play a very important role as the uh, conduit between our uh, parent organization, the Space Life Science Organization, and the Orion's uh, Health and Medical Technical Authority. And then we are, we are also uh, very involved in the uh, risk uh, under identification and uh, mitigation, and also have uh, many uh, independent uh, studies uh, to address uh, un unresolved human factors and health uh, issues. Um, another uh, very uh, important facilities, uh, that we, uh, in facility we have is the anthropometry and biomechanic uh, facility, or ABF. And now recently, uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, a major player in the constellation program, so EVA project, the extracurricular, extravehicular activity, 
uh, project. Um, their main goal is to develop a new space suit. So in this process, uh, they have identified some uh, key uh, uh, anthropometric uh, factors uh, to help inc improve uh, 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 EVA uh, development. Uh, our goal is to uh, help uh, facilitate uh, human factors engineers and others to develop the new space suit for the uh, constellation. Um, our uh, lighting environment has facility uh, in addition to creating LED uh, lights. Uh, when we look into the future, we're, talking, uh, we're thinking of um, using some newer technology that's available now, um, especially in the area of, uh, of emergency egress uh, lighting system. And uh, we have identified uh, something, uh, a very new technology called the uh, organic uh, LED. Um, these are very high brightness and very extremely low in power uh, organic uh, polymer. And they will greatly reduce the maintenance costs and uh, without compromising the safety of uh, uh, space operations. Um, let's just spend a slide uh, on uh, this future of uh, uh, human center uh, of our our, uh, our uh, NASA uh, endeavor. Um, <coughs> well, I've talked a lot about uh, using the uh, human as a system uh, uh, f uh, philosophy, but really our ultimate goal is to develop uh, uh, is to uh, introduce this philosophy we call the human centered design. Because we believe that a uh, human, since we are uh, as the user of the system, uh, any uh, system should be designed around the human. And therefore, uh, we, have, uh, we rec uh, I recommend a holistic and iterative uh, human-centered uh, system design method. And uh, we think this me method should go through a spiral and iterative process and to uh, explore as much uh, concepts as possible at the beginning especially in the, at the beginning of the process. And now uh, we should consider the entire life cycle. And uh, we also think that in addition to uh, most of the uh, 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 disciplines, uh, we also need to uh, include others uh, that we may, may, not, may not be able to uh, think about in the future. Um, what we have plan to do uh, in the near future is to uh, update the, uh, the next version of the NASA uh, standard uh, uh, systems Engineering Handbook uh, with some of the uh, HDCP relevant languages. So uh, this is a summary. Um, I think we have done a lot in the past uh, two decades. And uh, we have we are still continue uh, our endeavor and try to uh, promote our, uh, uh, our HASS model. And in the future, we would like to um, introduce uh, the HCDP, the Human Centered Design philosophy also in this uh, systems process. And because we really believe that uh, it will en greatly enhance our quality uh, in all the, uh, in the future space developments. I think that's what we ha all I have, and uh, I will be glad to accept any uh, questions. This is a list of the bibliographies I have uh, uh, conducted uh, during my research on this paper. Yes, that's all we have. And thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. That was really great. We appreciate your taking the time today to give us a preview of your, your paper and your presentation. And um, that concludes the presentations that we have for today. So I would invite anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, you can either, you know, give them to us now or you can always go on to our website remember we do have a, a SharePoint site um, that uh, we showed earlier and um, we are uh, we love to have you visit and see what's on there it's um, you know in work so uh, let us know if you have any suggestions and if you have any proposed topics or presenters or say hey have you thought about talking about this or putting this land on it? We'd, we'd honestly love to hear it. So feel free to give me a call. And for those um, remotely, again, my name is Debbie Burdich, and I don't have the my email up there, but I, I will. But you can always go on to that Knowledge Broadcast website and just let us know what you're thinking. And thanks again for coming here today or for listening in today and supporting us. And uh, we hope you'll join us the next time. Thank you. <laughs>